my love to thee, pure, warm, and changeless be a living fire. While life's dark maze I tread, and griefs around me spread, be thou my guide. Bid darkness turn to day, wipe sorrow's tears away, nor let me ever stray from the aside. When ends life's transient dream, when death's cold soul and stream shall on me roll, Blessed Savior, then in love, fear and distrust remove. Oh, bear me safe above a ransom soul. God, God's grace, mercy, and peace be to you from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, may his love be upon your heart, now and forevermore. Amen. Mao Zedong was the Chinese chairman of the Communist Party from its establishment in 1949 until his death in 1976. Well, in the 1950s, he put forth the idea, the idea of the Great Leap Forward, which was famously anything but a great leap forward. Great thinkers got together to formulate a utopian plan of success. The plan included seizing people's property. It forbade private farming. It took a stern clamp on food and wealth distribution. Of course, the idea was to distribute to the people what they needed as they needed it. Well, in the midst of all that, they had another grand plan from the great thinkers to eradicate disease, to eradicate pests. A noble pursuit for sure. And so the plan was to eradicate four pests. Mosquitoes responsible for malaria, rodents that spread the plague, flies that were just kind of a nuisance, and sparrows. Sparrows because they ate the hard-won fruits from the field, the grain and the rice. And this plan was just as bad as the Great Leap Forward, because after killing over a billion sparrows by their own estimates, they had no birds to kill a bigger problem, namely locusts. And so locusts and droves of locusts came and caused a severe famine. And that plan and the Great Leap Forward led to people being disincentivized to work, violence between neighbors, stealing and killing each other for food and money, and of course that boorish dictator in Mao. It is estimated that at least 45 million people died because of these ideas. Mao Zedong and the Chinese government at the time thought they could outthink their way to success. And not just success, but a utopia. Now, what they pursued was noble. They sought peace. They sought wealth and prosperity. A utopia lacking suffering. Great thinkers thought they could outthink their way to that. But they only proved themselves to be very foolish. Well, at the beginning of Ecclesiastes, it would seem that Solomon was searching for meaning or at least telling one of his children to how he had searched for meaning in his life. And by the end of the book, it seems Solomon is giving the answer to peace and wholeness in one's life. The very kind of things all nations desire and pursue, that individuals pursue, just like China. Well, in the last chapter of the book, Solomon makes a very wise appeal. He says, remember your creator. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. 
because eventually you get older and you will experience evils in your life. You will experience tragedies in your life and you'll age and you'll die. Remember your creator. Then Solomon pleads his son to heed wise words and be warned of anything in addition to them. For many books are written, but here is the end of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is all of man. Not just the duty of man, but the, the text literally says this is all of man. This is what he is. This is his being that he would fear God and keep his commandments. Now, before we go on, it's necessary to define peace. We all want peace and seek peace and need peace. So let's first define it. Shalom, or peace in English, is often thought of as the absence of war, the absence of violence, the absence of anger and bickering and arguing. But peace would better be defined as the state of being totally straight in line with our Creator. Additionally, since we are imperfect suffering creatures, Isaiah 53 verse 5 has some interesting commentary on peace. Isaiah 53 verse 5 says that the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. That is, the punishment was on Jesus and his wounds healed us. So peace to us in our fallen state is God's gift of healing. Peace or shalom, it restores, it repairs, it renews. Peace puts us back together. Of course, what is our problem? Our problem is we are broken shells of our former selves. We are born wicked. In the womb, we are sinful. And so we rebel and we sin. And even when we don't sin, we're still not in line with our Creator because we have this sin disease. And so instead of remembering our Creator, we often forget our Creator. And we replace our Creator. We replace our Creator with false gods. We replace Him with other philosophies and other religions and money and greed. And most commonly, we, we replace Him with the God of ourselves. We put ourselves before our Creator. Well, there is a study done in 2016 asking tens of thousands of Americans about their mental health. And the study showed that at least 117 million American adults have had or continue to have high levels of anxiety. Their lives are falling apart. They feel as though life is unbearable. The feeling that I can't go on. It is dark in my life. The World Health Organization tells us that the United States, which is the wealthiest nation, is also the most depressed nation in the world. You see, we all have an inkling that there is something wrong in the world because we face problems in our lives. And we all want to find a solution to those very problems, to find peace. Shalom. And what does the world tell you to do to fix those problems? The world tells you that you can get more money to fix those problems. More money, keep advancing. Money can buy the best treatments and technology to make you look younger and feel younger. Feel pleasure. Fill your days with entertainment. The world tells you pills can fix your problems. Since 2016, there are 25 new drugs on the market that will help your anxiety. Try a new pill. But here's a really big one. Knowledge. Knowledge will fix your problems. 
a new philosophy, a new outlook, a new form of government. Science and knowledge will bring us to the next stage of progressive, perfect utopia. The age of enlightenment back in the 1700s. Reason. Reason will win the day. Steven Pinker is a good example of this. Steven Pinker has written the book Enlightenment Now. And Pinker gives pages and pages of how the United States as a whole and the world as a whole has improved since the 1600s and 1700s. He has found that there is far less violence than there ever was. Life expectancy is way up. Infant mortality is way down. Food sources are far more abundant than they ever were. The world just seems to keep progressing into something better each passing century. And he concludes that reason and science and humanism will get us there because he thinks that they've always gotten us there. In other words, we can think our way there. Knowledge will get us there. And though his research is thorough, his conclusion couldn't be more wrong. Just hear what Solomon, why Solomon has to say about knowledge. In Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 17, he says, Then I saw all that God has done. No one can comprehend what goes on under the sun. Despite all of his efforts to search it out, man cannot discover its meaning. Even if a wise man claims he knows, he cannot really comprehend it. Or as Paul says, knowledge puffs up. And in the end, we really find that we really don't know all that much. We can't really figure it all out. Not really. Not totally. That's God's realm, not ours. But then there is a kind of knowledge that is more valuable than anything else, and that is what Solomon calls wisdom. And what is wisdom? Well, in another book by Solomon, in the book of Proverbs, he says, the fear of Yahweh, the fear of the Lord, is the beginning, the middle, and the end of wisdom. And Solomon says the same thing again in Ecclesiastes. That is why the end of the matter is to fear God and keep his commandments. For this is all of what man is. And how are we doing on the wisdom and knowledge of God? Well, not so well. For instance, GQ magazine just recently published an article listing books that you don't have to read, and the Bible is one of them. And they say that you don't just, you don't have to read it, but you shouldn't read it, because it's contradictory, and they say it is foolish. Another, another recent poll was done asking Americans if the Ten Commandments were still relevant today, and only half of the commandments received better than 60% in their rating. The top three least important to people today were the first three commandments, which were all about God and keeping the Sabbath day holy. Only half of the baby boomers today read their Bibles on a regular basis, at least once a week. Only one quarter of millennials say they read their Bibles at least once a week. Among churchgoers, only one, one out of five churchgoers say they never read their Bible at all. One in three say they didn't know that the nativity story was in the Bible. The Christmas story, the most famous story out there. They didn't know that it was in the Bible. And 60% say they don't know that the story of Jonah was in the Bible. Another study shows that only 10% of Americans hold a biblical worldview, believing the basic Christian teachings, things like Jesus was sinless, and he died for our sins, and the devil is real, and that there's an afterlife, and that the Bible really is reliable. Only 10% of Americans. And did you know that Jews do much better when it comes to biblical knowledge? 
Jews statistically score better on their scriptural knowledge than Christians. And it is because Jewish people are much more intentional about teaching their children the Torah and the Jewish prayers and customs from an early age into puberty and adulthood. Of course, none of this should really surprise us. A lot of us could see it coming from a mile away, the degradation of the fear of the Lord in America, from removing Bible reading in schools, from removing prayers in schools, to peddling abortion and freewheeling approach to sexuality, you name it, we've seen a lot of degradation in America. And then we hear that report that people are full of anxiety. We hear and listen to their cries, people telling us, it's too tough, I can't go on, I don't feel like it's worth it anymore. I don't see God at all. And instead of remembering our Creator, we turn to our knowledge, we turn to ourselves, we turn to our money, we turn to our resources. Sometimes we just forget it all and we escape. Escape in pleasure, drugs, and alcohol. And Solomon, in his book, says all of that stuff is meaningless. It's chasing after the wind. They will not get you peace. They will not bring you shalom. They won't put your lives back together. You won't find healing. You won't find repair or renewal in any of those things. Of course, where do we find healing, repair, and renewal? Of course, we know. Jesus. Jesus brings us Shalom. You want to be right with your creator, want shalom, go to Jesus. Paul got this in our epistle text today. Paul, in confessing that he struggles with sin, he says he is a wretched man. What a wretched man I am, he exclaims. And then he says, says this profound thought, who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God, who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. There it is. Jesus rescues. Jesus heals with his blood. Just as Isaiah 53 told us. We know the power of the cross. His punishment brings praise, and it brings peace. Shalom. Wow. Thank goodness. Hallelujah. Jesus. Jesus' sacrifice and his death brings peace. Jesus says in our gospel text today that we have been connected to him. And we have to be connected to him to be alive. He is the vine. We are the branches. And if we're not connected to him, we're dead, cut off branches. But if we are connected to him, we have life and life to its very fullest. And Jesus dying and rising, that is how he connects himself to us. Jesus connecting his, his baptism to our baptism is how he connects himself to us, to that tree. Jesus sharing his words and making them take root and grow in us that's how he connects himself to us, which means we have shalom. We have peace, healing, and restoration, repair. And we need it because we are broken, and we can't figure it out. Our knowledge doesn't ever reach that far. Atali Perkins Natalie Perkins, in 1974, was an 11-year-old girl who was a Hindu, and she loved her dad, living in India and in England and Ghana and the United States. Her dad led her in daily practice of giving gratitude and reverence 
to God. Of course, God in her faith was the Hindu God, which is really many gods, but has the mystical idea of many rebirths until one becomes one with what they think is kind of the eternal god of Brahman. Well, Mitali believed in this god until high school. Because in high school, one of her friends was killed tragically in a car accident. And she couldn't believe, couldn't believe God would allow suffering like this to allow many reincarnations into a painful world. And so she put God aside for a while. She went to college in California, and in college she was introduced to many other philosophies, many other religions. In a humanities class, she was to read the book of Genesis, and in reading it, she only scratched her head more at God. Naked people, fruit trees, a serpent, and a God who spoke and strolled through the garden and seemed as passionate as the Humans he created, doling out punishment as he saw fit. That made no sense to her. Did her friends really believe in this? Because she had Christian friends. Natali returned that Bible and was certain she would never read it again. Well, in her junior year of college, she went to study in Vienna. And two of her friends gave her books. One of the books was Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis and second book was a New Testament Bible. Some of her Christian friends gave her these books and hoped she would become Christian. Well, she was eager about mere Christianity because it was written by C.S. Lewis, and she respected him because she had read the Chronicles of Narnia, and she liked that series. But she was skeptical about that New Testament Bible because of what she read in Genesis. Well, while she was in Vienna, to past time, she would sightsee, and she went into many cathedrals, and in these cathedrals, her eyes kept coming back to that twisted, half-naked figure on the cross, looking as if he was sweating. Everything in the cathedrals were about Jesus, and then during winter break, she took a trip to Russia with her friends, and she thought, what a great opportunity to visit an atheistic country, get their perspective. Well, on her tour, she was led through prisons and cemeteries and Christian churches with histories of massacres and torture where ancient icons displayed that crucifixion. Atali was overwhelmed. She felt overwhelmed by evil. And again, she thought, how could God do this? How could God leave humanity alone to endure so much? And the tour guide noticed that she was thinking a lot, thinking very hard, and he asked her what she was thinking about. And she was surprised that she told him the truth, saying, a loving God, human suffering, how can both exist? And the man said, you are at an intersection of choice. Either you decide that Jesus is the Son of God, or you turn your back on him forever. You must choose. Well, Batali pondered those words, and when she returned to Vienna, she read the gospel story in the New Testament. And when she read it, she was moved by Jesus' compassion and words like, let the little children come to me. And this Jesus guy reminded her of many compelling stories that she had read in school and read by herself, the Chronicles of Narnia and Heidi and the Secret Garden. And she was again perplexed by a baffling man who infuriated his enemies, these religious leaders, by claiming to be divine. And then he did something more stupendous. He let them kill him. And if he was telling the truth, then this God was submitting to his enemy. And to, to the four greatest enemies, as described in mere Christianity, pain, grief, evil, and death. And he did it to destroy them all. The cross. The cross, then, was where a loving God and the suffering of humanity could finally be reconciled. And so there in Vienna, her heart was changed, and she became a Christian. 
Genesis now made a lot more sense to her. And when she returned to California, she was baptized. And today she is married to a Presbyterian pastor, and she writes novels for young readers. Like Matali, we're all looking for shalom, aren't we? Looking for peace. But suffering and pain disrupts it. That car accident, that pain in your life, that death in your life, those things you can't explain. They disrupt shalom. Our sins and rebellion disrupt it. And we can go on searching for answers everywhere and anywhere like she did. But ultimately, there's only one place to find peace. Jesus is in the heart of it all. His punishment bears peace. That is, him being punished gives us peace. He is the prince of peace. There's only one. Full of the knowledge and wisdom that brings us the full fear of God but also full healing, full restoration, and full repair. So what are we waiting on? We've tried those meaningless things, money, greed, pleasure, knowledge, and what do we find? Well, we find that we can't buy our way to peace, we can't pleasure ourselves into peace, we can't think our way to peace, none of that works. Only one thing works, and that is why the end of the matter is all about Jesus. And because of him, there is darkness that is overcome. And so we can go on. May his vine live in us, and may we teach it to ourselves, teach it to each other, teach it to our children, and stay in the boundaries of wisdom, and let his peace dwell in us forever. Celebrate it, sing it, live it. Amen, amen. And may the peace of God that surpasses all human understanding keep and guard us in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's rise and we'll sing our offertory. It's printed before us. <laughs>